to virtual reality simulations um, that academic institutions, mostly post-secondary, can use to deliver training modules for their students. Um, so for example, uh, crime scene investigations, um, firefighting, engineering, anything with hands-on um, experience that needs to be done, we create a virtual reality simulation that students can use. Okay, so our second speaker is Agusha, who graduated from a joint degree at Brock University and Niagara College and is currently a junior programmer and a quality insurance tester. She started a, a game company called Adjective Noun Studios. Agusha, could you be able to int introduce a bit more about yourself? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I started um, my company when I uh, was graduating from Brock University. Actually, Drew helped me a bit with that one uh, because we were doing, we had no business background doing it and Drew did, so we reached out to him. Uh, so now that company's been running for a year and then I also got um, work at Phantom Compass, which is a game company. So I basically am a game developer, programming, uh, testing, and uh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And then next we have today is Dorothy. Dorothy graduated from Brock University with an honors bachelor and a master's degree in accounting. She currently works at a public accounting firm in St. Catharines where she plans and performs audits uh, as well as help people task plan and prepare them. Dorothy, could you introduce more about yourself? Yes, hi, thank you, Julia. Um, so as Julia said, I went to Brock for my undergrad and my master's degree in accounting. Um, through my time there, I did take the co-op option. So I started working at a public accounting firm out in St. Catharines. And after finishing my master's degree, I ended up going back to that firm and I work there full time now. Um, so a typical day for me is just working on various audits of financial statements. And then I also do some tax planning services for clients and just general financial planning. Thank you. All right, that sounds awesome. Uh, our last speaker is Brian, who is a finance graduate from Brock, Brock University's Goodman School of Business and has a strong experience in venture capital, corporate finance, and, and analytics. He has worked at the BDC Capital and Fund Investments and at local startups as a consultant. Brian, could you be able to introduce a bit more about yourself? Yeah, certainly. So like a lot of us on this panel, I, or like all of us, actually, I also went to Brock University. Uh, there I studied finance and I had a minor in computer science or applied computing as it's known in Brock. Um, while I was there, I was a co-op student. So I took, uh, I planned out my co-ops to really look for a diverse set of experiences. So that included working FP&A, so financial planning and analysis. Um, at Fortune 500s. I also worked in venture capital throughout my, um, for, for two summers and um, also at two startups in Niagara, one being related to and the other being cattle immediately after graduation. Um, so I've got uh, some experience in, in startup. I understand the culture and what drives a business kind of from the stages of uh, maybe generating revenue and finding product market fit to beginning to really find uh, market share and growing to the 10 million to 100 million in reoccurring revenue. Um, and most recently, I was at the BDC uh, fund investments team, which worked with uh, about 100 general partner uh, venture capital firms that invest in technology companies across Canada. Uh, since then, I've left BDC and I'm now uh, doing a few contracts for, for startups and supporting uh, mainly the finance um, functions and working as a fractional financial officer for startups, um, as that's, that's a need that every company really has is accounting and finance. Uh, but generally at, at smaller companies, it's not necessarily something that a full-time hire uh, can address. Yeah, that sounds super fascinating. Um, yeah, so now we'll be having an open Q&A portion where uh, we'll be asking all the speakers a question. They'll be answering them. If you have a question you would like them to answer, feel free to type it into the chat and we'll be asking them to our amazing speakers. The, if you guys would also like to unmute your mic, you guys can also unmute and ask your question that way. Our first question is, what subjects do you guys have to be good at in order to be in this field? 
Um, and I'll hand it off to Drew to start us uh, to start us off. Yeah, sure. So I can kind of talk about it from two perspectives here. Uh, one is a business owner and then one is an employee who would work for our company. Um, so from a business owner side of it, um, it really encompasses a wide range of skills because um, like Brian mentioned, as an entrepreneur, you really need to wear multiple hats in small companies and fill a lot of positions. Um, so I found kind of uh, the general business degree that I was involved with early on and getting kind of a little taste of every different piece of it really helped me understand the full scope of what's involved with um, building a business. On the programming side, um, computer science is obviously a really strong um, field to go into and the game design in particular for VR creation. Um, so from the VR development side of things, we've hired all of our uh, employees out of the game development program at Brock University. And this basically combines a degree where they learn a lot about 3D spaces and artwork that is involved with that. But as well, they learn the programming side that the computer science um, degree would, would also benefit from. Um, so kind of that combination of understanding uh, 3D environments, as well as uh, the background uh, programming languages that go into it. That's kind of a really good combo for the uh, game development and VR side of things that we do. Uh, so for me, uh, programming classes are very important, but also uh, from the Brock program, uh, it seems that a lot of the knowledge that we learned was uh, humanity classes, which are like how it does it affect people so you're thinking about the end user rather than yourself like specifically towards making video games but it can apply for any media creation you don't want to think about the product itself you want to think about who's going to actually be interacting with it so understanding those connections are really important uh and then basically everything else drew said so i'm not going to repeat that okay and then dorothy i'm going to pass on to you Yes, thank you. Um, I also agree. I think Drew did a really good job of touching on everything. Um, but similar to that, just in, I didn't do a general business degree, but I did do accounting. And within that, we had a bunch of different general business classes. And I think that those can really help you, whether you're like me working at a firm, or if you're working within a certain company, a specific company, um, certain classes such as an HR class for human resources and a data analytics class. I think that they all just come together so that you understand the different aspects of all the different segments of a business. Yeah, totally. And then Brian, what, like, what do you think about it? Uh, it's a great question. I actually believe that right at the beginning of your degree, when you're really uh, beginning to explore and, um, and take a lot of classes across a wide variety of topics, that um, for me was what really allowed me to, to find a niche in the business world. Um, because when I, when I did start, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do marketing, operations, supply chain, or HR, um, or finance for that matter. Um, and so with, with university, when you do end up uh, beginning a program, you're going to have a few years, usually one or two years, that is very focused on a diverse um, set of education. And so really um, trying to learn and understand what, uh, what depth comes with each of the career paths is really, really important when you first start in university. Um, so what I, what I did is I spoke with my pr professors and really got to know what the career paths were um, and, and found a niche that really interested me in finance uh, because even two years into my degree, I wasn't sure uh, really where I wanted to head after graduation, but having a diverse set of classes really helped me um, kind of find my niche and find my calling. Okay, thanks, Brian, for the answer. And another question we have is, um, what made this field so appealing to you? So could you start us off, Brian? Yeah, certainly. Um, for me, it was helping business owners. Um, my, I have a lot of entrepreneurs in my family, and that's what immediately drew me to venture capital is helping uh, tech companies really grow um, because what with venture capital, it's not just about financing the business. It's really about 
providing um, introductions, advisory, and uh, helping businesses grow. And so that was really, really appealing to me. And that's still what I get to do um, now is work close with founders on, on uh, a variety of different startups uh, to help them build their financial future. Just like you might be saving currently for your university education, uh, businesses need to save and spend and invest. And there's a lot of research that, that goes into the decisions that businesses need to make when it comes to investing in their future. And uh, that's a really interesting problem to solve. And that's what I get to do every day. That's very interesting. Um, what about you, Agusha? What made the, your field very interesting for you? Uh, so I'm in uh, game development. And one of the things I realized that I loved was just designing worlds. And I'm not very artsy or anything like that. So being able to uh, use code uh, to show uh, some, make some something out of it as a creation really uh, helped. And then uh, the reason why I started my company was so that I can uh, make what I wanted to make and not have to work for other companies, even though I do work for another company so that I can get my, uh, so I can cost of living uh, and learn new things is why I'm working for Phantom. Uh, but it is, it's interesting because I love solving puzzles and it's a way I can do that and make something for someone else. That's very interesting. Um, Drew, what about you? What made your field very interesting for you? Yeah, I really like what Agusha said there about um, looking to solve solve unique puzzles. And what we do um, with helping kind of our end user clients and why we started the business is we knew VR was a really cool tool that could be used across a bunch of industries. And we developed different ways and business plans and different avenues where we might be able to tackle that. And the best thing um, I can say about why we do what we do is uh, the look on our clients' faces at the end that through our VR simulations, the um, end students that are actually going to be use these um, enjoy going through our simulations and actually enjoy learning a little bit uh, more than maybe traditional uh, methods may put forward. VR simulations seem very cool. So. <laughs> What about you, Dorothy? What made your field very interesting for you? So initially, uh, what drew me towards accounting was the high school class that I actually took in accounting. Um, and after that, I just noticed that it was something that I was good at and something that I really enjoyed. Um, so diving deeper into it, I work specifically in audit and tax. And with that, what really interested me was um, kind of being the middleman between a company and reporting their results to the users to ensure that we have the reasonable assurance to report these numbers and that we've used our analysis and we can back up everything that we have there and we believe them to be true. And then with tax, it was more so, tax is almost like a nightmare and a lot of people dread it and it's complicated. And being able to help people out with that um, was just something that really interested me. So essentially in one big thing, what drew me to it was that I enjoyed it and that I was good at it um, and that I could help people out. Yeah, I think it's super fascinating. I think it's really cool that you guys are able to um, impact people's life for the better. And a question we actually have from our participant is, what are some of the jobs you can do or careers you can do involving mathematics? Uh, I'm gonna throw it to Drew, can you start us off? Oh, sorry, Agusia. Oh, sorry. Uh, so actually in game development, a lot of the problems we get are purely math based where we're trying to figure out things, uh, trying to optimize the games, uh, things like that. So game development does have a lot of math and that applies to a lot of computer science. Uh, so those problems, uh, you'd be surprised how many everyday things run into uh, mathematical issues. Math is everywhere in our life. Um, and then Drew, what, what do you think? Yeah, so definitely with um, our game programmers, they're using math um, consistently to figure out new functionalities and everything that's involved with our VR simulations um, on that side of things as well. I'm sure Brian can talk more to this in terms of the finance um, component and what's involved with business analysts and um, data scientists and everything that can be um, related to helping uh, the business side um, answer questions that can make uh, entrepreneurs like myself make more informed decisions. So when it comes to forecasting, um, 
any of our, our future financials or figuring out what percentage of our company we should do for investment. Um, lots of math involved in all these pieces and um, definitely in the in the business segment of things, um, there's a lot of uh, different avenues that you could go through with the math, uh, with the mathematics. Yeah, and then you the, the, uh, the like the business portion is also a great field where mathematics is used. And then Brian, can you talk about like how business and then how math is involved in your field of work? Yeah, sure. So, so I can actually talk on two, uh, two experiences of mine. So the first being um, in analytics. So I, I've got uh, quite a bit of experience working in analytics, which is mainly math based, but it's mainly driven by um, a lot of data. And so if you're interested in careers in analytics, you're going to be using math um, on a daily basis um, and also blending that with technology to drive insights and decision making for businesses. Um, and any bank um, or really any uh, large company is looking for people with graduate degrees um, in advanced analytics, computer science, or mathematics uh, to help them make better decisions using all of the data that all businesses are collecting nowadays. So when it comes to analytics and data science, you're going to be using math every day. And those are very good jobs, high paying um, and high skill. Um, now, when it comes to capital markets and finance, like Drew said, um, when, it, when it comes to business planning and, and FP&A, you are using math, but it's not, um, it's not anything more complicated than your PEDMAS um, or PEDMAS, uh, whichever you use. But in, in some of the quantitative roles in capital markets, for example, trading or, or building quantitative algorithms uh, for, for uh, making markets, that is where you're going to run into to a lot of candidates and a lot of people that have higher degrees in math because um, there's a lot of, for example, quantitative hedge funds that will be recruiting PhD candidates in machine learning and computer science to, to help build models and uh, algorithms that can outperform um, really their, their competitors. And so they're willing to pay uh, top dollar for mathematic degrees um, and people who can uh, not only think mathematically, but also have the problem solving skills uh, to address uh, new opportunities in the market. Yeah, those things you just mentioned is a really interesting field. And Dorothy, what are your thoughts? I think um, mostly uh, a bunch of the jobs that do involve mathematics have been covered. Um, what I can add is specifically in like business and accounting, there's various roles that include math. So whether you're an accountant or you have an analyst position um, or a controller, bookkeeper, the list just goes on and on. I think that all of those roles do encompass math in some shape or form, whether it's different, some of them are more complicated, some of them are much easier. Um, and then even thinking beyond just business and accounting, there's so many jobs out there that do involve mathematics. So if you are good at math and you're not interested by a certain role or job that you hear, um, even some of the trades like plumbing, you really do need have, to have a good grasp of math to be good at that career. Well, I never like actually realized how much math has importance on everyday life. Um, I, I have another question that I received from one of like the participants and it's, what do you think are one of the biggest challenges that are in your field? Dorothy, could you start us off? Sure. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that's coming up in my field is the evolution of all of these different programs. So I know Adam was mentioning Python during um, the opening discussion. And there's a lot of these programs that are coming through where it's almost like, do we need auditors anymore when we have technology that could be doing these same jobs? And that's also why business analytics is becoming super important because as auditing and accounting professionals, if our jobs are in a sense being taken over by this, um, the business analytics aspect of it can really help um, to kind of compensate for that. So I think that that's a huge issue. Um, and especially with the whole COVID world this past year, auditing specifically has had a huge shift to being more virtual. So 
I think that technology is just a big breakthrough and it's a challenge for now, but I do think that it will, the outcome of it will be great. Yep, thank you for your answer. Technology is like really reshaping how jobs are in the industry and how like the world is becoming now. So Agusha, what are, what are some of the challenges that are in your field? Uh, so as uh, Dorothy mentioned, a huge thing is evolution. Uh, so we use game engines and every month they release another update with new features, new bugs, and you're like, oh my God, I'm like stuck dealing with new issues now. And so you're always constantly learning. Like every day I'm learning something new. Like one of my coworkers today mentioned something. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. That's good to know. Nice feature. Um, and then also it's the fact that um, since I'm working in a field that is for entertainment, a lot of it is trying to get uh, known. Like there's so many, like if you look at movies, there's millions of movies being released. How do you know, like how do you stand out is another issue. Um, so that's my take on it, biggest challenges. Yeah, my brother um, is like studying for becoming a computer engineer and I can always hear him talking about debugging and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then like the struggles of them. So what about you, Brian? What are some of the challenges in your field? Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit more from the perspective of maybe a student uh, coming up the ranks and beginning university. Um, I would think the, that one of the most important things that you can do is become data literate. Uh, so that is not only understanding how to use data to, to drive decisions, how to drive insights and how to use the tools for data uh, analysis, but also understanding the potential flaws that come with data um, and, and just, I, I, I'm not exactly sure on the terminology necessarily, um, but making sure that you're using data that, um, that represents the population properly um, and that doesn't have any inherent bias. Uh, because what you see a lot of the time uh, today and something that has come up uh, time and time again is ethics in data. And so if you're going to be working and pursuing a career in mathematics, uh, it's very likely that you will be working with data in some type of way. So it's always important to know your source and understand that, the, that there are always potential limitations um, with the data that you're going to be using. Thank you, those, were, those are some really good advice. So Drew, what are some of the challenges that are in your field? Yeah, to um, even elaborate on what Agusha said in terms of keeping up with the technology, um, not only is are the game engines coming out with new versions every day, there's um, hundreds of new programming languages that you can learn that can be um, utilized in different situations, and some are better than others for certain things. And um, best advice I can kind of give here um, is kind of what we've seen is being able to kind of touch in the main ones as much as possible, especially at early. So you can kind of get your hands um, into each of these different types of programming languages. And then from there, you can kind of focus on what you enjoy doing and then promote those as the skills that you want to maybe work in later down the road. Um, so the earlier you can kind of uh, branch out and take a look at all the different options that you have and cover kind of um, a big wide stack, uh, as they call it, in terms of languages, that's uh, a good kind of step in the right direction. Um, another challenge that we normally face is on the hardware side of things as well, where with our end user, we're looking at developing for um, headsets that may not even be out yet. And we're hoping on the hardware companies to actually release these headsets in time for our software applications. So constantly just being um, up to date with the hardware that your software is gonna work with, um, whether that be the computer specs of whatever program you're launching, um, making sure that the end users have the specs that they need. So for example, um, pretty standard that people have four gigs of RAM in their computer right now. That wasn't the case about five, 10 years ago. Um, so <laughs> just, uh, just making sure that you're covering all the bases there. Um, on the point of starting a company and challenges that you kind of face in the early stages with that, um, you really, uh, you, normally when you look at technology, you look at all the different things that it might be able to do and all the problems it'll solve, but that usually pulls you in way too many directions. And um, some good advice I have is to really focus on one thing and do that one thing really well. Uh, the more you can kind of narrow down um, the piece of technology you want to get into, that'll really help you kind of uh, focus that idea and move it forward. Yeah, those are super insightful things you mentioned and about how um, technology have, a, uh, have evolved with the times and also about how you should uh, focus on one thing when doing a startup and do that thing really well. And a question we have from our participants is, 
what percentage of your technical knowledge come from formal education versus things you learn as a coursework or things you learn after you finish your degree? I'm gonna direct it to Brian. Sure, um, percentage, it's hard to ballpark, maybe 20% um, comes from education, maybe even less than that. Um, formal education is really good at kind of stress testing your ability to hit deadlines and uh, communicate well with team members. And, and it's really the, the foundational blocks that allow you to work in the business world. Um, but at the end of the day, the training that you're going to get on the job or through extracurriculars is going to be much more niche and it's going to be exactly on the topic of, of what you're working in. Anyways, when you're not so much in a formal profession like maybe engineering or, or accounting, um, because the, the problems that I face on a, on a daily basis, uh, they, they weren't things that were addressed necessarily in the classroom. However, the thinking that comes with being able to solve case studies um, and mathematical models and stuff like that certainly assists with being able to solve problems at work. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, as you develop through your career, uh, you're going to get a very niche uh, set of skills. And that only comes with experience on the job. Um, but I think education as a whole at the post-secondary level is a really good way to, to bridge the gaps from high school to being able to work in a career. Yeah, so your answers is super interesting to hear about how uh, university helped prepare you with the skills you need. Um, and Agusia, what do you think? Uh, so for my program, it was a very unique structure program. Uh, I was part of the first cohort. Uh, so like we basically were the guinea pigs uh, of the program testing it out. And uh, it was it was a joint program between Niagara College. So uh, we got a lot of the college hands on experience while getting all the textbook uh, university level skills from it. So it was a good blend between it. So I'm going to say about 50% of my skills were learned uh, were taught through it. Uh, mainly because of the unique uh, experience. And then to add on to that, uh, it was also the fact that we did a lot of projects and we mimicked the real world. We mimicked game companies. So it made us uh, like literally threw us into the pool and went, have fun, make a game. And that resulted in uh, us teaching ourselves, how do we approach this? So when I started my studio with my like friends from when we graduated, uh, we already knew how to do it because we'd done it multiple times, at least not in like the actual business standpoint, but how to get a game done. We knew the basics of it. So that really helped uh, get us going, but it was us showing the extra initiative, pushing ourselves th through what the school, like what post-secondary taught us uh, really got us um, prepared for the uh, for the real world in a career. Yeah, I mean uh, the program, you, the degree that you took, the joint degree, is really uh, is a definitely a unique program that I think really helps you prepare and give you that applied knowledge. And then Dorothy, what uh, what was your experience? So with my field, I think that I would have to give it a 50-50 split. Um, I just do think that formal education for accounting is super important. There's various different regulations like within the accounting handbook or the income tax act, and it's things that you need to know. But then also with co-op and actual work experiences when you learn how to apply those things. So I found a lot of times that there were things that I learned at school and then I would go to a co-op term and I'd be able to apply them. But then there were also a lot of times where I was working and I would learn something and I'd be like, hey, I didn't know this yet. And then I could later use that in a school term. So I would have to give them an even split for me. Yeah, and then your mention of co-op is also great because that's an opportunity students should take advantage of to help prepare them for the world. And then Drew, what is your perspective? Yeah, so I'm definitely leaning um, more towards what uh, Brian had said there in terms of kind of a 20% um, in terms of technical skill. And I think a lot of that comes down to um, exactly what he said. And then also um, with entrepreneurship in general, where um, we get the theory from teachers 
it's great. You can kind of understand the concepts in class, but until you have a project that's related to it, it's hard to kind of apply that theory in a, in a practical setting. So the projects definitely help in that sense. And then um, by participating in case competitions or uh, extracurriculars around campus, that's how you really hone those skills and be able to do it over and over and over again. Um, personally, I really like repetition for memory. And if you kind of uh, take a theory, do one project with it, it's probably not gonna resonate as long as if you try to apply that to three or four different scenarios. Um, so that's kind of my take on the on the school side of things. And then with being an entrepreneur, there's just so many unanswered questions that uh, couldn't be answered in our uh, entrepreneurship classes because of um, depending on what field you're going in. So for example, with us being in the uh, new tech industry, there's, um, yeah, like I said, new hardware and software coming out all the time that even our programmers weren't necessarily prepared to learn about. And the companies that just release these new things that we need to work with, we're learning on the fly consistently of what we need to do to update, how, how do we transfer this knowledge into our current skill base, and how do we keep our team moving forward? Yep, thank you for your perspectives that like showed us how um, co-op and um, work experience is very important as well as education, formal education. So we have another question, which was um, from one person who said that they're interested in computer science. And so they were asking if there's any recommendations for extracurricular activities related to computer science. So I'll give that question to Agusia because she, her career is based on that. Uh, so, um... Some uh, call, uh, for some high school program uh, extracurriculars are like if you have a robotics club, that's really good. Anything that's a uh, like logic puzzle based uh, things. Uh, my high school had a computer science club. Uh, I went to Mississauga for school, so I don't know if that will be in Niagara. Uh, then in um, what other things? Uh, even if you just start up a project, uh, it, it's not going to be something that a school is going to host, but making a project yourself, like coming up with an idea, say you really like, uh, I don't know, watching movies, making a database with uh, a bunch of movies or whatever, just testing your skills, just playing around is a really good way to get something going, especially when it, when you do get to the point of looking into starting at the in the workforce, you can be like, I made this thing four years ago. And then I went back to it when I got more uh, technical knowledge. And now it's even better. So just trying things is a really good uh, way to start, uh, start trying things that are um, is a really good way and then things that you're interested in like if you have an interest in playing this kind of game or this kind of movie it really helps uh turf i can i can chime in here um so one, one like projects i think is is a great probably the best way to really um hone your skills and get and dip your toe in the water to see if you really like it is is applying that um, one thing that, that uh, is really good is GitHub. So GitHub has a bunch of um, little projects that will walk you through um, kind of like, for example, developing a calculator using Python um, as, a, as a beginner project would, would certainly tell you and give you a little bit of experience to, to let you know if it's something that you'd really like to pursue. The other thing is CS50X. Uh, CS50X is actually a first year Harvard class that is now offered uh, free to anybody. So if you do um, think that computer science is something that you'd like to do in university, you can actually go today for free and, and try a university course um, through Harvard. So I uh, would suggest you look into that CS, CS50X. Yeah, thank you for your advice. I agree with that as well, because I've done like a small project before, which was I tried doing a rock, paper, scissors doing Python. It worked. <laughs> um, so I, uh, there is another question, which was, um, what are some of the benefits of going for a job within the math and computing field? So I'll give that question to Drew. Sorry, I'm just looking for the question there. I had, a, I had another point on the uh, on the previous question there as well. Um, so I'll just throw that in quickly and then I'll move on. Um, so uh, to Agusha's points there, and other things to look into are game jams, um, especially for uh, computer scientists and uh, game, game programmers. Basically, you build a game in a weekend, um, kind of put it to the test, con uh, conceptualize the idea, 
um, push yourself to really tight timelines and deliver a product on Sundays. So that's kind of a, a good way to get these projects up and running. Um, you can find them hosted by either uh, local universities or even um, institutions like uh, the Niagara Falls Business Enterprise Center um, or Innovate Niagara, different uh, regional innovation centers that can help um, you find local competitions. Um, this also includes pitch competitions in general. So if you wanted to enter a pitch competition with a new tech idea, there's some um, obviously computer science related with that in terms of conceptualizing how you would build an MVP of a product. And those two things right there can really uh, kind of provide an extracurricular insight as to what um, small projects may look like and then scalable moving forward. Um, so to the point about um, hiring, sorry, the question was about hiring mathematics or business specifically. No, um, it was about like, what are the benefits of going into like a math and computing field? I see. <clears throat> um, yeah, from, from my side and what I've seen with our programmers that we've hired, uh, the, the biggest thing is uh, solving unique problems. So we're working with really new hardware, really cool technology, and our clients are coming to us with these problems that they can't figure out how to solve. And with us putting our heads together, being able to overcome issues that were yesterday problems and now um, happy solutions we can deliver is a, a real kind of day-to-day -day benefit that our, that our programmers get to see. What about you, Dorothy? What are some benefits in your field? I think it all comes down to just being able to help your clients or help customers um, using your math skills. Um, in kind of touched upon this earlier, but in almost every job, you can think of basic math as a skill. And I think that the greatest benefit that comes from it is being able to use something that you're good at in your math skills to ultimately help an end user. Yeah, I mean, that's super fascinating, all the points you guys have mentioned. And a question we got from a participant is, are there any summer jobs to think about to help them get a leg up in the business world? And I'm gonna direct it to Brian. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as far as summer jobs go, uh, when when you're in high school, really, uh, it, it's it's difficult to sometimes get a technical role because most of the time they are looking for candidates who have university experience or are enrolled in a program that has a, sp a specific education uh, component to it. Like, for example, computer science, it would be tough to get a developer role without um, having being enrolled in a computer science program. Uh, my recommendation would be uh, to, to find a job that you're interested in, um, because no matter which job you're going to be getting, it'll be working for a business, you'll be able to get connections, you'll explore an avenue. Um, so especially when you're young, explore things that you think you might be passionate about. And uh, don't, uh, don't worry so much about um, being able to get a leg up in the business world. There's a lot of time for that. Really at a, at a young, young age, you should be in exploration mode. So try a lot of different things and uh, see what sticks. Yeah, and I love your point about keeping an open mind so that you can explore new avenues that you might be interested in and you just don't know about it yet. Um, and then Dorothy, what do you think? I think Brian did a really good job answering that question. Um, from high school, you don't really have any of the qualifications to get a very meaningful role anywhere. Um, so it is important to just kind of see maybe what industry you're interested in or something like that. Because I can tell you for sure, I did not have a business role or get my leg up anywhere before I started university. Um, but then that's why I do think that co-op is a really good option because it allows you to explore those different options and see what you like or even where you fit in because not everywhere is it the case that you start a co-op term or you start a job and that's where you're going to stay. Um, there's a lot of things that come down to it, whether you're a good fit, whether it's something that you enjoy um, and I can go on forever with that list. So I think that I agree with Brian in the sense to just explore your options um, see what you enjoy, and then consider a co-op option for a program so that you can further explore that. And even through Brock specifically, and I'm sure every other university, they have great connections and they have networking events where you can make connections with different individuals and companies that interest you. Um, and you can slowly figure it out from then. It's not something that you need to have figured out before you start university. 
Yeah, and I agree with the, like the co-op option about how you can use that time to explore once you have like the technical knowledge. And um, Drew, uh, what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, so definitely along the same lines of um, co-op in university was definitely a huge step for me and being able to explore kind of the role of what starting a company looks like because I was working directly with um, students that were looking to start companies and getting that hands on experience on that side was obviously very beneficial. But before I came to university, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And um, one thing that I did discover after I had left high school and was part of the university program um, was that there's funding available for students in high school that are looking to explore opportunities in entrepreneurship. And these programs actually provide them with funding that would uh, replace um, what you would probably earn over the summer months to take a stab at, at what your new technology idea might be. And even if it doesn't come out to fruition, at least it's good experience that you can definitely put on a resume that you've gone through this process of trying to start a company and looking into all the different avenues um, and a great kind of resume booster here. I'm gonna post the link um, to the government website here for anyone who's interested. For next summer. I mean, those are really insightful. And then summer company is a great program and that gives you $3,000 to start a business in the summer, which is awesome. And finally, Agusia, what, what do you think? Uh, so as everyone mentioned, co-op's really good. My program uh, didn't have a co-op, but it did have an internship. As Drew mentioned, he has actually hired some people in my program, uh, which really helped. Uh, also, all of the networking events, as Dorothy mentions, uh, so in Niagara region, there's uh, tech mashups uh, in St. Catharines where I was talking with my professors who also ran studios or something. Uh, and we would just like, it really helped. Uh, I got my job at Phantom Compass by networking with one of the execs there. And she was like, just send me your resume and I'll, 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 um, I'll send it to the others. And then I got the job. So it's a, uh, it, try, putting yourself out there is most important. It, you'd be surprised uh, the people you talk to that lead you to this. So uh, this event, I uh, never met Emily who's running it, but uh, I got this job from doing another panel uh, for someone else and then they recommended me for it as being a good uh, fit for this. So it's kind of crazy how connections can lead you to a place. So just be open to those to happen and they'll fall naturally. Yeah, networking is very important in like advancing into a certain career or field. So this question is directed towards Agusha and Drew. So it was, what was your experience founding your own company? I can start us off here. Um, so experience from the very beginning, I'll be honest, it was very challenging in the early days. Um, like I mentioned, to focus on one important thing that we wanted to be really good at. And we basically took VR as a whole and started branching off into uh, VR rentals. We were shooting 360 videos. We wanted to develop software. We wanted to launch VR arcades that people could get into. And trying to tackle all that at once was absolutely impossible. And it took us a while of just uh, basically when we talked to potential clients, they were not interested in everything. They needed the one solution that they were looking for. And trying to figure that out through technology is a difficult path, but once you get it, um, it's really easy to transcribe that message to your clients and get that into their hands. So for us now, what we focus on is replacing any hands-on training that can no longer be done um, either due to COVID or just due to limit, uh, uh, restrictions based on the type of field it's in. Um, so the more we focus on just developing really high quality hands-on learning experiences, the more we're able to tell our clients about that kind of situation. Um, other things that we ran into in the beginning was not knowing how much things are going to cost and trying to figure out exactly when to hire people, when we should be potentially looking for investment, all these different kind of pieces that um, you don't necessarily understand right away when you're starting out in a new tech company. Um, so one kind of piece of advice there is to start with a business, a business plan, um, simple business model canvas can kind of wrap your head around exactly what uh, costs may be associated with it and where money's going to come from. Um, and that's kind of a good way for uh, that we kind of got organized and we're able to kind of plan out what our next six months and year would look like. Um, last big challenge that I just want to mention that if you are looking to branch out and kind of start your own thing um, is make sure that you have kind of your personal finances in place for that. So for example, working at another job to then fund your startup with, which is um, 
what Agusha is doing right now and what I had to do for a long time, totally valid. Um, it's kind of what you need to do to solidify that like you're going to be okay at the end of the day. And eventually um, you'll know when the time comes that you'll be able to make that jump and jump into it full time. Um, so even if it's tough in the beginning, working kind of a full-time job plus trying to work on your startup, it's definitely rewarding in the end if you can get the business built up to then replace your daily income. Uh, so going off of uh, Drew's point, uh, so for me, I started my uh, company with my two friends. Uh, when COVID started, we were graduating, we were deciding we're going to start a studio. We actually went through a program uh, through Brock uh, because we had no business background. We weren't trained uh, with the technical skills. We just had our, uh, we were, uh, we we're experts in our field, but not on the business side. So we went to a pro uh, went through a program. Uh, it's called Kickstarting Entrepreneurship Program. It is available to any Brock students uh, super useful, taught us what a business model canvas was. Uh, so we'd actually be able to know where to put our foot to even start with the concept because just it's so intimidating. Uh, we had a lot of challenges uh, dealing with like trying to get a lawyer when it's COVID and no one knows the proper uh, steps to actually doing that. Uh, and one of the biggest things we as uh, co-founders were discovered was to uh, keep communications open. Uh, so I would tell them, uh, this is going to be my uh, financial situation. I'm going to be working another job. I'm going to only be able to work for us uh, at this time from this time. So you won't, So we were going to have to figure out how we're going to deal with this. And that really helped us uh, uh, move forward and keep our business alive by just talking to each other and uh, like trying to figure out all the possible plans, taking every possible opportunity to getting uh, the best foot of like a steady ground. Those are totally solid points and uh, connecting with people and talking with people to help find solutions. And I love your point about trying to put out like a business model canvas to help establish your ideas. And we are getting close to the ending time. So if you guys as participants have any last minute questions, feel free to put them into the chat and we can quickly answer them before the session close up. Uh, and then a question we would like to ask everyone is, what is a day in your life like? And what are some advice you guys have for students interested in going into your field? I'm going to use uh, Dorothy. Could, uh, would you guys would you like to start us off? Sure, of course. Um, so a day in my life, I would say, is tough to explain as every day it can be different. But I will, in a normal world, go into the office, uh, check emails, get back to clients on anything, and then I'll start going through my task list that I have. Um, and it involves various different things. So I'll do reviewing some month ends. Um, I'll do a lot of audit planning, a lot of audit work, um, planning audit dates. Um, and then, especially in this season, I do do a lot of actual tax return preparation. In some of the prior months, it would be tax planning. So it kind of depends time of the year. Um, and every day it is really something different. Um, some advice that I would give to someone going into my field, especially if you do want to stay in public accounting, is to really learn how to have a good work-life balance while also meeting all your deadlines. Because especially right now, it can be extremely stressful and overwhelming, and there's a lot of work to get done. And on top of all the tax stuff, um, there's all these COVID wage subsidies and all of this that everyone needs help with. So it is important that you get all of your things done on time and that you do your best because it is your work for the client. It's the purpose of your job. Um, but you also need to learn to have time for yourself and for your family and for anything else that you could enjoy. Um, so I think that's the piece of advice that I would give. Yeah, that's a great advice, the idea of a work-life balance and um, try taking care of your mental health at the same time. Uh, and then Brian, what is your thoughts uh, on your field? Um, yeah, I mean, it, well, during my roles in finance, it would have been fairly uh, similar to Dorothy's um, day to day. Uh, but I can touch on what it was like at Cattle, working at a at a small startup. Um, really, at the beginning of the day, it was about uh, you know hammering through emails, making sure that um, I'm I'm meeting certain deadlines and tracking projects properly. Uh, then it was going through the reporting log, making sure that 
myself and the team of analysts were uh, properly keeping up with the client reports that needed to be hit. Um, and then I also worked partly on, on setting up uh, the people and performance part of the business, uh, which included, uh, you know, working with the CEO and the co-founders on finance problems, interviewing candidates for hiring. Um, and then additionally, there was some work with project management, which was always really, really interesting. So this was uh, making sure that teammates and myself, we were hitting deadlines on the projects that we were tracking, prioritizing different opportunities that the business had, and, uh, and making sure that the rest of the team was um, fulfilling their duties, had enough work, but not too much. Um, and yeah, I mean, in the, in the nature of the environment now, it's a lot of Zoom calls. <laughs> Yeah, so what kind of advice would you give to a student going into a, like financing or capital investment? Yeah, so uh, when it comes to finding a career in capital markets, um, really what it would be is pursuing a degree in either computer science, finance, or accounting. Um, if you are going to do computer science or mathematics for that, um, you would certainly want to, to get experience while you were in school in finance or at least be pursuing a designation, for example, your CPA or your CFA, uh, depending on what kind of role that you would want. If you wanted more of a controllership role or um, an FPNA role, CPA is, is probably the way to go. If you were wanting to work directly in investments or portfolio management, uh, then CFA um, would certainly be uh, the way to go. And that is on top of your university education. Um, and then the one thing about, about finance specifically is you need to network like crazy to land the top tier jobs. Um, and so if you really want to break into banking, it's about meeting people, making sure that your resume and your story is very, very sound um, because it's a, it's a very competitive field. And yeah, the advice you give are really helpful about how students can prepare themselves. And then Drew, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so on the um, point about uh, ideal hires and kind of what to look for, um, for us and our programmers, exactly what we do is it's great to have kind of the generic computer science um, focus, like uh, look at things, but you definitely need to specialize in whatever area that you want to be most interested in and work towards, um, whether that be AI, whether that be game development, whether that be sound design. Um, there's all these different things that kind of are embedded within computer science. And the more you do your research early as to what specific niche you may want to move towards, then you can strategically take classes, whether that be in university or third party trainings or whatever the case may be to kind of build up the skills on that side of things. Um, I realized I skipped my normal day, so I'll cover that right now. Uh, normal day for me uh, starts off the, with a five minute uh, team meeting. Basically, everyone jumps in a room quickly, 30 seconds. What are your major tasks that you need to accomplish today? Um, the second we all are confident in what we need to do, we branch off into separate voice chats. Um, our team, because we were completely remote, we are in a consistent voice chat on Discord all day long. And essentially, we build a bunch of different voice chats that we can jump in between to get information from different people. Um, so normally, I'll branch off into kind of uh, our, our business chat and start working on catching up with clients, uh, mostly around proposals that are outstanding. And then when we do get proposals that are confirmed, take that information and laying it out in what the next few months of our business cycles look like. Um, while I'm kind of working on the business in that sense, I also work in the business um, answering any questions our team has um, in terms of the simulations we're currently creating. And then end of day, we always test our VR simulations to figure out what bugs need to be fixed and what we need to do the next day.